Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 through 12. I know it's early, and so some of us are, are still waking up. I, I, I'm an early person. I can get up at 4, 30, 5 o'clock, and I'm wide awake, and I'm ready to go. And I, I'm hitting the books, I'm, doing, I'm getting ready for the day. And usually by 9, 10 o'clock, i am uh, actually got an 8-hour day already in. Where my wife is, a, is not a, a, an early person, so she gets up and she's like, who are you? I'm like, I'm your husband. <laughs> don't you remember? No, I don't remember anything right now. I'm trying to wake up. You know, well, do you know where you're at? No, I don't know where. You know, it takes her a while. And by 11, 12 o'clock, you know, she's like, oh, okay, now I remember you. So I know it's hard in the morning. So, you know, our, our God, our Father in heaven is, is nothing like our earthly father. You know, there are people that, that view God in heaven like their father on earth. And they have a, a distorted view of, of who God is. And sometimes we, we look at God that way. Uh, we, we compare God with people on earth. We can look at our husbands or our wives or, or those that stand behind a pulpit, you know, those that are in Christian churches. And we can look at those men and think that God is like that. When in reality, God is nothing like humanity. In fact, God isn't human. He's deity. He is God. We're human beings that he has created in his image to be like him, but we are nothing like God at all. And so make sure that you have the right concept of who God is, who the Father is, who the Son is, and who the Holy Spirit is. Because God the Father loves you more than you can even imagine. He loves you so much that, that he could pour it on you and it would kill you how much he loves you. In fact, he demonstrated his love for you. How? By sending his own son. His son, who is deity, not human, but he became human to walk among us so that he can understand, or we can understand exactly, that he understands our infirmities, our illnesses, our struggles, our cares, our worries, and so forth, and then give us grace and mercy when we need those things in our lives. God is nothing like our father and so if you have a view a negative view of your father which many do many people uh don't like their fathers because their fathers were mean their fathers didn't talk to them their fathers may have done some other things to them you know and so they have a a struggle with men uh, the, <clears throat> they don't know how men should treat them or they're looking for a certain type of man to treat them and and, and so they're confused because their view of god is that father that raised them get rid of that view God through the lens of the scriptures and what God has revealed to us that God is a loving caring God he is a merciful God he's a God that loves you more than you can even imagine that's the God that we serve and Jesus is trying to make that point here he's he spoke about prayer earlier with the the Lord's Prayer our Father who art in heaven gave the disciples they had a desire and a hunger to pray and he said this is how you pray and he gave them the outline and now he's going to talk about how our Father in heaven cares about us enough that he answers our prayers the context here is important we realize in in, in this Sermon on the Mount chapters um, 5 through 7 uh, we're dealing with Jesus speaking to his disciples and he's giving basically uh, it would be like the Old Testament Ten Commandments. You know, Moses coming down with the Ten Commandments and saying, okay, these are the commandments that God has given for you to live by. And Jesus is in, in the Mount of Mount here and he's giving his commandments or his constitution to them. This is how you live. And so when he's talking about prayer, as we saw in chapter 5, retaliation, love, chapter 6, the charitable deeds and how we do them, prayer and fasting, um, wealth and how we deal with wealth, and then even judging one another, how we deal with judging one another and, and how we worry and care about things. These are all the things that Jesus say, be concerned about. Uh, be concerned how your attitude towards these things are and make sure that your attitude and your character are aligned with the Lord's will concerning these things. And so we come to... Uh, verse 7 where Jesus is saying ask ask and it will be given to you now <clears throat> the context here of, of these verses because they are uh, a thoughts of Jesus and, and and it's not a continual thought that, that just takes the end of one thing and goes on continually you have to try to really 
get the context of what's taking place here. So as he enters in verse 7, we can go to verse 5 where Jesus basically calls uh, believers hypocrites uh, because um, they need to first remove the plank out of their own eye before they try to remove a speck out of their brother's eye. And then he goes on in verse 6, Do not give what is holy to dogs or cast your pearls before swines, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you into pieces. And so that's where Jesus left off, uh, basically saying, look, uh, be careful how you judge, because in the manner that you judge, uh, I will judge you. And so if, if you're compassionate and merciful and, and careful in that judgment, then I will be the same to you. Uh, be careful that you judge rightly in handing the gospel out, the message to people. If they're willing to receive it, give it to them. Sit down with them. Train them. Uh, that's what we're looking for here in this church. We're looking for people that, that, that want to get involved, that want to be used of God. And by the way, that is a Christian. A Christian is one that says, look, I, I have given my life to God. I've surrendered my life to Him. Now I want to be used by God. What's my purpose what is God's plan for my life? And how can I allow Him to fulfill that plan and purpose in my life? So here I am. Uh, I want to be trained. And so then God raises up the church, right? Ephesians tells us very clearly that He raises up pastors and teachers and evangelists for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. And, and, and so we are to equip you to work, to service uh, in the kingdom of God. That is our purpose. Now, there are those that don't want that. They just want to come in and sit. And I don't want to offend those of you that want to come in and just sit and, and, and leave. But God wants more for you than just coming in and sitting. I understand that there's a time of sitting, a time of growing, a time of equipping. But there's also a time when you say, now I need to get involved. I need to do something for the Lord. Those are the ones we're looking for. But there are those that just don't want it. And so you don't cast your pearls before the swines. Uh, you share with them, you love them, you care about them, and you let them go the other way. And so making the proper, proper judgment. And so asking the Father for these things is important. How do we do this, Lord? How do we judge rightly? How do we live our lives? Uh, we need your help. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's go ahead and read these verses, verses 7 through uh, 11 first here. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be open. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your Will your Father who is in heaven give you good things to those who ask Him? Highlight that part there. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give you good things to those who ask Him? Now there's a, a, another cross-reference to this. Luke also gives us the same scriptures, but he adds something very interesting which I think I need to bring up. In Luke chapter 11 verse 13 He's, this is what Luke says. This is how he writes it down. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? He adds the Holy Spirit, where John just says, uh, gives good things to those who ask. Can we say that maybe Matthew didn't give us uh, the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit knew that Luke would give it? Can we add that in there? I think we can, and I think that we should. Because we need to ask for the Holy Spirit to come into our lives. We are to trust God with our lives, and we need the power of God in our lives. And the way that we get the power of God is by the Holy Spirit who comes in us, around us, and empowers us. He really is the force and the power that we need, and we need to seek on a daily basis. As I was waking this morning and I was praying and seeking the Lord for today's message, I was praying, Lord, anoint me with the Holy Spirit. Fill me, Lord God. Just overflow me. I, I really need your help, Lord. I can't do this on my own. And I pray that every Sunday because I know that in my own flesh, in my own strength, it's impossible for me to, to teach the Word of God. I need God's power to do so. And so Luke gives us that cross-reference of the Holy Spirit. Now, now, this is not Jesus 
complete teaching on prayer. There is so much more on prayer that we can we, we, we can really look up and, and discuss. I mean, not just about uh, praying for things, needs, and concerns, but also praying for forgiveness that we saw in the uh, chapters uh, 5 uh, in the Lord's Prayer about asking. And when we ask, we ask in faith. Uh, also, when we're praying and asking, we ask in accordance with His will and not just because we want something. So there's so much more on prayer. And so this is not an exhaustive teaching of Jesus Christ on prayer. He has a point here. And that point is, again, that we have a Father in Heaven that hears our asking and He will give us what we have need of. So He's simply making that that emphatically central point of a loving, caring Father uh, who will effectively give us what we need. The point is not that we have to be persistent, though you can get that out of this scripture, you know, ask, seek, and knock. And in the Greek, those those words are in the continual present tense. Uh, it's suggesting that you keep asking, you, you keep seeking, and you keep knocking in your prayers. But that's not his point. Because you can keep doing those things and God can still say, no, this isn't good for you. Now that's an interesting point because sometimes we think that God needs to just give us what we want. And that's not true. We as believers, if we are Christians and we call ourselves Christians, we know that God loves us, He cares for us, and He wants to protect us. And so when we ask Him for something, we know that He will give it to us if it is beneficial to us, if it is beneficial to the kingdom, if it is beneficial to others. But if it will harm us, others, or the kingdom, then no, no. If He has another reason, like maybe He needs to work in your faith, works work in giving you patience uh, then he will not give you those things so that you patiently wait and you seek you ask and you knock those are things that a father does Uh, I do that with I I did that with my children I purposely did things uh, to them so that hopefully they would grow and mature in their faith with Jesus Christ there were times where they would ask me for things and I'd give it to them there were times when they asked me for things and I wouldn't give them to them There were times where I would give something to their brother just to watch their response in me giving it to their brother. If they got jealous or if they were happy for their brother and then I would explain to them, why aren't you happy? Well, how come I didn't get one? Uh Uh-huh, that's why you're not happy. See, there's a problem there. You should be happy when your brother is rewarded or when God blesses them. And so these are things that we do as an earthly father. Why won't we allow God to do the same? He loves us enough that he'll take care of us. Spurgeon said to receive a gift is simple. To find a treasure is more enriching. And, and, and what is enriching is knowing that when we go to the Father, that He has every intention to give us what we have need of. So Jesus says in verse 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open unto you. Now that word ask there, it means beg, call, crave, desire, require, implore, beseech. I mean, it's giving us the idea that we should be on our faces saying, Lord, will you answer me here? Will you help me in this situation? I'm asking you with all of my heart. When we want something, we really need to beg the Lord for that thing. You know, my boys wouldn't always get what they wanted because they were my children. Well, now I'm in a different phase of life where I have grandchildren. And grandchildren are different than children. I am not their father. Their father and their mother are the ones that are teaching them and guiding them and leading them in the way of the Lord. My responsibility as a grandfather is to spoil them And so when my granddaughter comes and says, can we go do this, Poppy? I'm like, okay. Can we have this, Poppy? Okay. (laughs) And I just, I spoil them. I don't say no to them. Because I just, I I love them. And I tell my wife, you have to say no. Because I can't say no. I just can't say no. And she she says, well, you have to say. I go, no, I'm not saying no. You have to go over there if you want me to stop. Because I just, I, I love them to death. 
And, and I know I'm causing probably some, some real critical damage there somewhere, <laughs> you know, but that's for their parents to, to, to uh, uh, you know, come in and guide and lead them. That's their responsibility. I believe mine is just to spoil them to death. But God wants to ans answer us. He really does, but he's going to give us what is good. He says, seek. And the word seek there, again, in continual action, is seeking so that you find it. It might, it might not be what you're looking for. You might not even know what you're looking for, but yet seek it out. Lord, what is your will? What do you really want in this situation? Now, he doesn't tell us exactly uh, what we're asking for, whether it's material things, whether it's protection because we're living in a very, very angry world, or whether it's just provisions for our daily needs. He doesn't tell us that. And I think it's because uh, it's all of those things. And so there are times where we don't know how you're going to pay the bills, Lord. So we're just asking you somehow, Lord, pay the bills. We're seeking. We're, we're asking this person. We're, we're working in this situation. And we're over here. We're seeking somewhere where all of a sudden you provide for us. So just seek and keep seeking uh, the Lord. And then knock. Again, uh, knocking. Once you seek... And once there's an opportunity, you go and you knock on the door and hopefully they open the door and there you go. You got your answer. Now, you can remember this really easy. Uh, ask, seek, and knock. Just remember the word ask. A-S-K. Ask, seek, and knock. And so when we ask, we seek, and we knock, our Father in Heaven knows what we need and He will answer us. Uh, George MacDonald said, Prayer is the first thing and prayer is the second thing. And the third thing is prayer. So we need to pray, pray, pray. There's nothing wrong with praying. Uh, the struggles that we have is when we don't get the answer that we want. That's the struggle. Where are you, God? Why didn't you give me what I wanted? This isn't fair. You give them what they want. How come not me? You don't love me as much as you love them. Can you see the disciples and all of that? I mean, they did the same thing. They did the same thing. I was totally blessed. My mom... Um, has been having uh, uh, some weaknesses in her body. She's feeling weak, uh, tired. And it turns out she's anemic, so she's losing blood somewhere. And so they did some blood tests on her. They found out she didn't have leukemia. Uh, so uh, they wanted to do a, uh, a bone marrow test. And you've got to go through the back and to the bone, and you have to chip some marrow out. Merle, Merle, whatever the word is, and, and then you test it. And from what everyone was saying, it's a very painful test. In fact, uh, uh, one of the ladies here saying their husband went through it and he was like screaming and they had to ask her to leave because they want her to see her husband going through all that pain. The doctor told my mom it's going to be very painful, so uh, prepare for that. So I had taken her to Kaiser and, and with the intent of, of then taking her straight home so she could just lay down and hopefully be as comfortable as possible. And so I just put out there, and I know a lot of people were already praying, especially family members in Virginia put it out there too. I just put it out there. Please pray for my mom. She's having a bone marrow uh, test, and I hear that it's very, very painful. And I was totally overwhelmed by the response. Over 50 people responded, a lot of comments that were praying and so forth. So that just blessed me. I didn't even know I had that many friends that were actually praying or would pray. Uh, and, and then secondly, she went in there, uh, with the intention that God, because my mom loves the Lord, in these latter days she is really clinging to the Lord a lot. She talks nothing about the Lord all the time. And every time something happens, it's praise God, He knows what's going on, he, she's just trusting the Lord. And, and so she went in there with, God's going to take care of it. I know it. And she's not worried. She's not, you know, uh, nervous. Uh, she's not thinking about the pain. She says, God's going to take care of it. She went in, she went out with no pain at all at all it, there was nothing and she she was telling me that the doctor was like wow you're really calm this is amazing because men are usually screaming and yelling at this point and when they kick more and they're not liking it because they're laying down you know and it gets even worse because they won't just lay still but boy you're calm and, and, and they and the doctor said it's probably because you're a good person you know? and, and so it's because of jesus christ who made her a good person it's because jesus was there and he heard the prayers of his saints for her. And so he answered that prayer. Now, does God always answer prayer? No. No. Like I said, there might be a reason why he doesn't answer prayer at times. Um, we've been praying faithfully. 
uh, for this building right here on Etiwanda uh, to move from this place to this other place over here. And we've been praying for 20 years for this place. We've been kind of keeping it a secret because we wanted to move one day. If we were to grow, we just need to grow. We're just not growing. Uh, we need to grow, people. <laughs> we need to grow. You need to invite. You need to get people here. Uh, so we've been praying. Well, we just heard yesterday they sold it. And it's going to become offices. So, Lord, what happened? You, I could go home. Lord, I thought this was our place. I thought you were going to give it to us. I thought, you know, in all these doubts, he doesn't want us there. And then I, my, I love my wife and how faithful she is. She goes, well, how do you know God isn't uh, letting them do all the work? And then all of a sudden they lose it. And then we get to go right in there. I'm like, yeah, that's a possibility. You never know. So what do I know? You know, what do I know? What do I know? I don't know anything. It's like that, that story. We just trust in God. You know, the... the the boy goes out to his, his ranch there, opens up the stall, the horse gets out and runs away. Neighbor comes over to the guy and says, Ah, oh, it's too bad your boy left the, her, the horse out. And the guy goes, Well, what do I know? Next day, the, the, they catch the horse and he brings a bunch of other horses with him uh, while he was out there. And so the guy, neighbor, comes over and says, Wow, it's a good thing your boy let the horse out that could bring all the other horses. The guy goes, What do I know? You know I don't know anything. Well, then the boy's taming one of the horses. And as he's taking one of the horses, he falls down and he breaks his leg. And the neighbor comes over, wow, it's too bad that your boy let the horses out and they brought more horses and now he's got to tame the horses and then he breaks his leg. And the guy goes, well, what do I know? And then all of a sudden there's a war going on and men come by to take all the young eligible men into battle, but they can't take his son because they've got a broken leg. The neighbor comes over and says, oh, good thing your son let the horse out. We'll bring all the horses to break his leg. And now he doesn't have to go to battle. And the guy goes, well, what do I know? See, God is in control. He has every scenario in control. He knows exactly what's going on. And he has a purpose and a reason for it. And we have to just trust in him. So he goes on, for everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Very, very simple image there that Jesus gives us, an understanding that when we ask, uh, when we seek, and when we knock, God's going to open the door for us. What we find as an answer, it's up to him. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? I remember um, we were in the car and I used to like to get the Wrigley's uh, peppermint gums. And, and you know how you unwrap the tin foil and you, you take the gums? I would wrap them back up and really like, make like they look like they were still gum in it, you know? And so then I would uh, keep them in my pocket and Roman would ask, hey, can I have a piece of gum? And so I'd pull, yeah, here. And he'd pull it out, but there'd be no gum in it, you know? So who'd, who would ask for a piece of gum and you not give them gum but a wrapper? That's what, what Jesus is saying here. Who among you, if a son asks for bread, you're going to give him a stone. You want some bread? Here. Oh, Dad, what was that? Well, you wanted bread. There's a stone. No, you wouldn't do that, would you? I mean, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever to do something terrible like that. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent or a scorpion or something like that in the negative sense. Now, the word or is interesting because it's carrying on the questioning simply substituting the fish and the snake. Because the point is, is that here we are, as human beings, giving good things to our children because we wouldn't give them bad things. We really wouldn't. So verse 11, he says, If you then, being evil... Wow, Jesus just called fathers on earth evil. But they usually don't give their sons stones and serpents. If their sons ask for bread and fish, they usually give them the food that they need, put the clothes on them, and yet we're still considered evil? That's a little unfair, a little harsh. I mean, aren't we good at all? No, we're not. The Bible says there are none righteous, no, not one. Uh, all our righteousness are like filthy rags. Now, how does that make you feel? It makes me feel bad. Well, it shouldn't, because it should help us realize that we need someone, and that is Jesus. That He can make us righteous. He can change our life. <clears throat> you know, I, I grew up in, in Rosemead, uh, Rosemead, California. As a little boy, I was there third, fourth grade, and I was telling Virginia, we watched the movie The Neighborhood the other night. And I can remember as a little boy with my friends down there at the, the schoolyard, and uh, we were gathering together, and somehow we caught wind of gangs. <clears throat> and so here, there I was with a marker and I was writing on the wall, I mean, a big old W, ch -ch -ch -ch, 
And then the, at the last W, you just put two lines for the F for white fence. And it was a gang that was prevalent out there. And that could have easily have gone that way. And it was just shortly after that that we moved from there to Roland Heights, which was an all-white neighborhood, all-white neighborhood. And so here I was in, in, in a, a, a gang community of white fence, big gang, and, and could have got involved, could have gone in the wrong direction there. And my parents moved us to Roland Heights, which is now I'm in an all-white neighborhood and a totally different uh, environment and a totally different challenge for me as, as a Hispanic young boy, first family there being Hispanic. So I went through a lot of battles, a lot of struggles, a lot of fights just because I was Hispanic. And then here I, I meet my, my wife, in a birthday party at age 13 and I fall in love with her and I'm totally Hispanic you know I'm wearing my cholo outfit you know my my um, my sweatshirt with the creases you know my pants and the hush puppies at the time and so forth and she just white girl comes up and she likes me for whatever reason you know and and so we hit it off we get to know each other on the phone and we hook up in high school and and then all of a sudden, um, we become boyfriend and girlfriend. And there I am with my cholo outfit, my white t-shirt, and I am creasing it. And I'm ironing my pants with a crease, wearing winos. Winos were, were a rubber sole, usually a tan color. And then the canvas on top, which usually was uh, black, or you could buy brown ones. And now I'm taking all of this that I know, and I'm now pushing my wife to wear. So now she's frizzing her hair and wearing the makeup with all the highlighting on it, you know. And, and she's wearing the stretchy tops. And, the, and uh, people don't even know this. And with the corduroy jeans, you know, and she's creasing her pants with a little cuff at the bottom, nice and cuff, with a crease on the front, you know, and then wearing her winos. Her stretchy belt with the letter V for her her name, Virginia. And there we are in school hanging around each other with one of the uh, leaders of a uh, walnut gang there. And we all hang around. We all hang around with each other at parties. We go to the houses and everyone's making out and drinking and, and doing things like that. You know, this, this is where I'm coming from. This is where I'm coming from. And I think this is all okay. This is life. This is what you do. You know, and then all of a sudden she gets pregnant. She gets pregnant, and now we have a, a child. And we don't understand this. We have no idea or concept of how wrong this is and how hard this is going to be. And then later in life, I become a Christian at the age of 24, 25, right around there. And I realize what an evil person I really was. I really was. So when Jesus says, you being evil, I totally understand that. Because my motives were totally selfish that whole time. It, it wasn't about my wife. It wasn't about anyone else. It was about me and my own pleasures and wants. It's really what it is. And so I understand when he says evil. And I don't take offense to it because I know that I'm a sinner and I fall short of the glory of God. And so I know that he can take a life like that and he can turn it around because all of a sudden here's this little cholo guy and now the only heroes I have is her parents, her family, who are white, they're doctors, or lawyers, and I'm like, man, I need to get educated. I need to learn. I need to be something. And so I started going to school. I started learning electronics, and then I got involved with, with Edison and got a good job, and I totally went white somehow, you know, and I don't know what I am now. So somehow she flipped it around on me, you know, and now she's, <laughs> she's turned me into someone else. But here we are, and people look at us, and they just think we're normal, normal beings living on this planet. They have no idea where we came from. You know, but God turns it around and He makes you good through His Spirit, through His life, through His Word, when we surrender ourselves to Him completely. He'll take us from what we were evil and He will turn us into good. But it's His goodness and righteousness that we depend upon. So yeah, I'm evil at times. I have selfish reasons and motives and so forth. But God can turn those evil things around uh, for good. Yet we still love our kids. And then it goes on and says, know how to give good gifts. Us being evil, know how to give good gifts to our children. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask? So again, the, the comparison, which you can't compare an earthly father to God. If you are evil and you know how to give good things, how much more will your Father in heaven? Do you really believe that? Do you believe your Father will take care of you? Do you really believe that He has your back? 
Do you really believe that, that he will take care of those bills, that he will take care of your relationship? I mean, I'm, seriously, I, I am talking seriously here for a second. Do you really believe that? Because if you believe that, the, then the evidence of that will be the peace and rest in your life. See, my mom walked into that place. God's got it. He's, he's going to just help me. And she walked out with no pain because she really believed it. Where people are like, yeah, I really, I believe God's got my back. And then they're like, but I, and they're crying, they're worrying, they're like, their whole life's just messed up because they really don't believe it. And that's why they go through the sufferings and the pains and the worries and all these things. Because they really don't believe that their Father in Heaven can do greater than their Father on Earth. We need to really believe it. <clears throat> it is so evident when you believe it because when you're going through something, let's say cancer, which is a big thing, someone going through cancer, and you watch them going through that cancer, you can tell if they're having faith or not. Uh, if they're having faith, they're just like, you know, God's in total control. And you're looking at him like, how can he have so much peace? And he's not, it's like he doesn't even care that he has cancer. But he's going through the chemo, he's going through the radiation, but it's just like, how can he just be so happy? And he's in church and he continues to serve. And how Because he's got God and he believes that God has his back. Compared to a person that's like, could you pray for me? I'm really having a bad time. I don't know if God's going to be really, really going to heal me or not. You know, then lacking faith. Lacking faith there. And so we need to be like that man, honest with the Lord. Jesus came down from the mountain. He finds this man and his son in convulsions. You know, and he says, Jesus, can you help? He says, yeah, if you have faith. And the man says, help my unbelief. Because I don't believe you right now. Help my unbelief. And then Jesus healed him. We need to be honest with the Lord. Lord, I'm struggling with my faith. I'm struggling believing that you are capable of even taking care of me. I don't know what tomorrow will bring. I don't know if I'll be here tomorrow, but I know God is in control of tomorrow. And He knows exactly. I don't know if we're going to get that building. It was a bummer. And you know, my faith lacked at that moment. Like, ah, oh, I thought we were going to have that. But I don't know. God, you already know. And so, maybe you want us here for the rest of our lives. You know, I don't know. At least my life. Um, I don't know. Maybe we're going to buy up property around us. Who knows what the Lord... I, I'm trying to think big and positive. You know, but whatever the Lord's will is, He knows exactly what we need. And He's going to give it to us when we ask. So now we come to the golden rule, and we'll, we'll end here. It, it does relate to, in the context, because when you go to verse 12, uh, it, it says, Therefore... Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. The word therefore is what I'm looking at. And of course, when you ever see the therefore or wherefore, you always have to look back at what he just said. So somehow this ties in with what he just said about asking. It ties in with, with trusting in God and knowing that he will give you what you have need of. And so, what is he saying here? It's called the golden rule. Most commentators will say the golden rule. I don't know if you've ever heard of the golden rule. I remember when I first read this and started looking at commentaries and they said the golden rule. Men live by the golden rule. I'm thinking, what is the golden rule? What are they talking about? Uh, the commentators that I were reading, they're like, everybody knows the golden rule. I'm like, I don't know it. I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, the golden rule would be like the Ten Commandments. You know, there was a time where everyone, I live by the Ten Commandments. You know, I love God. I go to church. I don't take His name in vain. You know, those are the golden rules. Well, here Jesus is giving us a golden rule, in a sense. It's the same one that Luke gives us in 631. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them, right? That's the golden rule. Look, look. The way that you want men to treat you, you treat them the same way. That's a golden rule. You want people to be nice to you? Be nice to them. You want people to be supportive and, and giving? Then you be supportive in giving too. That's the golden rule. What you want men to do to you, you do to them also. And that's what Jesus is basically saying here. Kind of like the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. Now, whether you knew that or not, but it's an underlying hidden thing that we all just happen to understand in our own minds. It's general and I think it's basic. That like, if you want people to help you, then you need to be a helpful person too. You know, I'm blown away by the fact that other churches would be involved with this, with a summer fest. And so I could take and always take, hey, we need help. Hey, we need help. We got this event. But what about also giving? 
That's what Jesus is talking about, thinking of others and not just yourself. Because there are people who just take, take, take. You owe me this, you owe me that. There are children that are like that. Well, I didn't ask to be born. You had me, so now it's your responsibility. Really? <laughs> I don't know what Bible you're reading. You know, um, take, take. But then when you're asked, oh, <laughs> oh, <gasps> you know, it's like you're dying. <sighs> Why would you even ask? What kind of person are you? All you do is ask, ask, ask. All you do is take, take, take. And so, I want to give back. You know, so when these other churches are having events, I go to them. I support them because I don't want them to think that I'm just taking from them too. And so Jesus said, think about others also. Think about what you would have them to do you. Remember David and Saul, the struggle they had in the Old Testament? You can find this in 1 Samuel chapter 24 and how Saul hated David. <clears throat> David had many opportunities to kill Saul, but he wouldn't. He said, I cannot touch the Lord's anointed. He had the golden rule in mind. Look, I don't want him to touch me, and so I'm not going to touch him. I'm not going to touch him. I'm not going to take his life. Though I had opportunity to kill him, there have been several opportunities. There was one time where David and his men were hiding in a cave. There was a cave in the side of the wall, and they're all in there just hiding. They had their spears or swords, and they're like against the wall. And Saul comes in with a few of his men because he had to relieve himself. And so rather than do it out there, he comes into the cave, and there's David and his men hiding up against the wall, you know, and there's Saul right there. You know, and he's relieving himself. How easy, like David. That quick. That easy. How many opportunities we get to people? You know, because we don't like what they're doing or because they are now asking. You know. But he did and he says, no, I will not touch the Lord's anointed because I don't want him to touch me. And so he doesn't touch him even at that moment. There was another time where he actually cut his garment and then showed him, I could have killed you. I could have killed you, but I didn't do it. You know? The golden rule. <clears throat> thinking of others more highly than you think of yourself. The Bible says. Looking out for the benefit of others more than you look out for your own benefit. And it's interesting because here it says, whatever you want men to do to you. It's emphatic there. That Greek word. And he, Jesus is pronouncing it again. To you, look, what do you want men to do to you? I want them to be nice to me. I'm getting I'm tired of them being mean to me all the time. Well, then you be nice to them also. And you can just take that on and on and on. And so thus, you fulfill the law and the prophets. And that's Jesus' way of saying the Old Testament. You can take the whole Old Testament together and you would summarize it in this. And basically what Jesus was saying is, look, this is what you need to do. Just love. Just love. Right? If you just love, then you don't need to have rules and regulations in your life. Because if you just love, if you just, if you just love your parents, then go, what a good boy you are. What a good girl you are. Man, you just love me. I don't even have to ask you to take the trash out or to clean your room because out of love, you do it without a problem. That's love. And the parent goes, wow, you need something? Hey, I'm there. Let's, let's go get it because I love you too. And you don't have bad thoughts. Oh, I wish that. I wish he was never my dad. I mean, I don't know how many times I got that. I wish he was never my dad. Really? I mean, come on, are you serious? Do you have an ounce of love in you that you would think of your dad that way? There's something wrong there. You're so selfish that you would wish your dad to never be your dad. That is a heart that is cold and broken. It's not the heart that Jesus would want you to have. A dad who, who watched you come forth in the hospital become a baby and said this is my son this is my daughter I love them and put clothes on you and put a warm blanket on you kept you in a house and did as much as he can to take care of you and then all of a sudden you grow up and I don't wish they were never my dad why because I didn't get the sunglasses I wanted wow really sunglasses Jesus said just love if you just love then you don't have to worry about any other commandments. You don't have to worry about rules and regulations because when you love, you're thinking of the 
benefit of the other person. That's really what we should be doing, is just loving. It's a hard concept to understand. And it's one that I'm still learning to, to apply in my own life, is just love. Because I was one that was looking for love. That, that little cholo Mexican kid, you know, I was looking for approval and love. I didn't think my parents loved me because they weren't giving me what I wanted. So they don't love me. And so what was I doing? I was looking for love. I looked for it in my friends. And they were all, I would go to their houses. And, and we were going to go out to, to party or whatever. And I'm just sitting in the room with them while they're ironing their clothes. You know, come on, dude, hurry up. He goes, hey, it takes time, man. You know, ironing their T-shirts, you know, ironing their socks. And, you know, just, uh, all right, come on, starching it. Psh, start, 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 start. You know, so it really, really just has a clean, I mean, you touch the, the line and it cuts you. That's what they wanted, you know. And, and then finally, after two hours of ironing, okay, now let's go, <laughs> you know. And we go, I wanted their approval, just like anyone else wants their approval of their friends. Because when their friends accept them for who they are, their friends are like them, and so they love me. They care about me because they care about the things that I care about. And it's all about finding that love. And so when I was looking for that love, I was looking for love also in women. And so I found a woman that loved me. I thought, ah, this is love. But I didn't realize that it wasn't love, it was lust. Because I was evil. And I really wanted lust. But I was looking for love. And it wasn't until Jesus came along and I realized what true love was. That he sacrificed his life on a cross for me. And I thought, that's love. Boy. Because I'm evil. I'm a sinner. I have broken so many rules, hurt so many people. And yet you died on a cross for me. That doesn't make any sense. How could you love someone that much to die on a cross for them? And it blew me away. And I realized that God loved me. It didn't matter if my dad loved me, my mother loved me, or my wife loved me, or anyone else loved me. I know God loves me unconditionally. Even being evil. Because even while you were yet still a sinner, Christ died for you. Even while you were in sin, He died for you. That's how much He loves you. That blows me away. That blows me away completely. That God would love me that much. And so you learn to love like Him unconditionally accepting people exactly how they are but not expecting them to stay that way because they are now Christians and they're going to grow and they're going to change and they're going to understand that love of God in their own lives Romans chapter 2 <clears throat> verse 6 I believe says that it is the kindness or the love of God that, that brings men to repentance when you truly understand the love of God and that you don't deserve it, boy, your life will change. When you can finally understand that concept, your life will change. Because you don't deserve it and yet God loves you. It will change you to love just as He loves. 